Um, I call this uh, hearing to order. And today uh, we're privileged to hear from uh, two nominees, uh, Jennifer Clyburn Reed, whom President Biden has nominated to be the federal co-chair of the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission, and Chris, uh, Christopher Frey, whom the president has nominated to be to serve as the assistant administrator of the Office of Research and Development at the Environmental Protection Agency. We warmly welcome both of you today. Before we hear from uh, our witnesses, uh, Senator Capito and I would like to say a few words about each of them. Dr. Jennifer Clyburn Reed has built an exemplary career as an educator and advocate for strengthening the economic, the social, physical health of communities in her home state of South Carolina. I wrote, I, I just wrote this in, I hope this is correct, a proud Gamecock. Is that proud Gamecock? And graduate of the University of South Carolina. Dr. Reed has spent nearly 30 years as an educator and an education leader. Most recently, she was the uh, director of the Center for Education and Equity at the University of South Carolina, her alma mater and co-director of the Apple Core Initiative, a scholarship program at the USC College of Education. She's also CEO of the Palmetto Institute Issues uh, Conference, an issues-based advisory group that promotes uh, accessible and equitable policies in education, in health, in housing, and infrastructure. I had the privilege of meeting uh, with Dr. Reed virtually yesterday, found her to be an engaging leader who is deeply committed to helping communities across Southeast uh, Crescent uh, region. And if confirmed, uh, Dr. Reed will be the Southeast Crescent uh, Regional Commission's first federal co-chair since it was created in 2019. Just let me repeat that. If confirmed, Dr. Reed will be the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission's first federal co-chair since it was created in 2019. Having her in this role will allow this agency to fully commit its resources toward addressing economically distressed areas across parts of Virginia, uh, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. So I'm delighted that uh, Dr. Reed could join us here today. We look forward to hearing her vision for this role. Uh, she'll, I'm sure she'll uh, uh, introduce a couple of relatives and maybe some friends that are in the, the audience, but, but uh, Senator Capito and I have had the privilege of serving with, uh, with your dad, and it's a special privilege to welcome him uh, here today. I'd like to say that I could, we could see his lips move when you speak, but with a mask on, we won't see his lips move at all. <laughs> but we know he's here to provide uh, encouragement and, uh, and support. Uh, President uh, Biden nominated our second w witness today, Henry uh, Christopher Frey, who I believe goes by the name of Chris, to serve as EPA Assistant Administrator for the Office of Research and Development. Dr. Frey has built a remarkable, accomplished uh, career as a pioneer in the fields of modeling human exposure to air pollution, as well as the measurement and modeling of vehicle emissions, and applying those emissions uh, estimates to risk assessments. At a time when the EPA is recommitting itself to science-driven decision-making, Dr. Frey's experience makes him an excellent choice to lead research and development at the agency. Dr. Frey has been a professor for 27 years at North Carolina State University, where he has dedicated himself to research and cultivating uh, the next generation of scientific leaders. He also has extensive experience working with the Environmental Protection Agency. In 1992, Dr. Frey was a, a triple AS. A tri I'd never heard of a triple A. I've heard a lot of triple A's, but a triple AS, Environmental Science and Engineering Fellow at EPA. And he has served as, uh, served as Exposure and Modeling Advisor in the EPA's Office of Research and Development's National Exposure Research Laboratory from, I believe, 2006 to 2007. He's also served in several other capacities at EPA through the years, including as a member of the EPA's Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and uh, Rodenticide uh, Act, FIFRA, affectionately known as FIFRA. Science Advisory Panel from uh, 2004 to 2006, as a member of the EPA's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee from 2008 to 2012, as chair of that committee from 2012 to 2015, and as a member of the EPA's Science Advisory Board from 2012 to 2018. 
Let me also add that Dr. Frey has received public support from seven of his uh, predecessors for this role, including both Republicans and Democrats, going back to the Reagan administration. There may be no better endorsement for a job than from someone who has held it before, much less seven former leaders who served in his roles from both sides of the aisle. I also had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Frey earlier this week, and he is quite impressive. Uh, should uh, he be confirmed, he will be undeniable champion of science-based decision-making and scientific integrity at the EPA's Office of Research and Development. And we're looking forward to hearing more from him today. But before we do, we're going to hear from our ranking member, Senator Capito, for her opening statement. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our two witnesses today for uh, being willing to serve. Uh, I think um, it's an admirable uh, trait uh, that uh, public service, and we certainly appreciate those efforts and look forward to hearing from both of you. Thank you, Chairman Carper, for having the hearing. Um, as, as he has mentioned, uh, Dr. Jennifer Clyburn Reed uh, is, uh, will be the first um, to lead the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission, which is going to be an interesting uh, exercise for me to watch since we have the Appalachian Regional Commission in our states, and we've seen how that's developed over the years. And then, of course, the Environmental Protection Agency Office of Research and Development, Dr. Chris Fry. Um, each of you has uh, devoted the majority of your careers to education, and for that, you deserve a great recognition. I thank you. Dr. Clyburn Reed, and it's nice to see your father in the audience uh, today. I had the pleasure of playing golf with him one time, We're quite the golfer. Um, I commend you for your service in education at all levels, because you've obviously taught at uh, every, every level in every, a lot of different types of situations, and for what you've done for your state of South Carolina. I look forward to hearing about you and what your plans are for the commission. Uh, Dr. Fry, I know you have been a um, college professor for 27 years, including at the University of Pittsburgh and North Carolina State University. Um, and you are now nominated to, for this position. Um, as we discussed during our meeting last week when we spoke, and I thank you for that, uh, this is one of science, a uh, scientist, not a policymaker or a politician. The research conducted in this office is used to inform critical policy decisions made by the agency's regulatory offices. Establishing public trust requires that the scientific studies are developed in an open and transparent fashion, you and I talked about this, not hidden from robust public scrutiny. Um, I, uh, transparency, I, I, I get, I take the opportunity every time I get the chance to talk at this, at this dais, to talk about the, the frustrations that I have with this administration on transparency, because it's not only critical in the scientific process, but also in policy proposals and the accountability that accompanies these decisions that this administration is making. I am, I am very disturbed about this administration's lack of transparency, particularly on climate and environmental issues. I have asked repeatedly the EPA and the White House several times now under uh, now how the new U.S. Nationally Determined Contribution, or NDC, under the Paris Agreement was calculated. I am still waiting to hear how that calculation was made. Um, the, the pledge being to reduce emissions 50 to 52 percent by 2030, and how is that possible and what regulations would be put in place to make that possible? Administrator Regan committed to me back in April to provide EPA information used to develop the NDC, and he has not fulfilled that promise. I'm actually going to have breakfast with him next week. I'll have to, I'll have to make sure, uh, not only here in a public forum, but privately to reiterate this. At the end of October, and after repeated uh, attempts to get information, I still do not have a substantive response. I get the sense that slow rolling the, this information, hoping that this tax and spending spree that we see being squabbled over over on the House side um, would have been enacted by now and overshadowing some of the regulations that this administration has planned. But that hasn't happened yet. Now the administration is trying to have something uh, to present it to the climate conference in Glasgow which will, uh, to show the world that it will meet its overly ambitious targets. They appear focused on that audience rather than the American public, workers, their families, and uh, folks that are elected to represent them in Congress as everybody watches their energy bills begin to skyrocket. Proving this point in remarks earlier this year, John Kerry, the White House international climate czar, called for the U.S. intelligence community to verify the authenticity of Paris pledges by China, Russia, and other countries, stating that I think the president would want to know if something is just baloney or if a country is misleading. This administration has eyes wide open for the pledges of other countries, 
but they have been closed the door uh, on the accountability to Congress and the American people on what the costs and what the sacrifices and the benefits would be. At the same time, the administration, through an interagency working group, is pursuing options to develop and apply a new cost for emitting greenhouse gases. President Biden wants to use this figure, known as the social cost of carbon, in all areas of federal decision making. Following several requests from me and other members of Congress, the leaders of the Interagency Washington Working Group admitted that they will not hold a single public meeting on this issue. Despite the potentially wide-ranging effects of their proposals, administration leaders are yet again hiding the ball from the American people. Administration officials make vague, unanimous, or ominous remarks about using untested regulatory pathways to cut emissions. Yet Mr. President, Mr. The president, President Biden, still has not put forth a nominee to lead one of the EPA's most significant offices, the Office of Air and Radiation. That's the very office that is reportedly developing the costly and far-reaching environmental regulations the presidents will tout in Glasgow next week. In the midst of a major supply chain and transportation crisis, the president has not put forward a nominee to lead the Federal Highway Administration. The administration uh, the agency responsible to oversee the safe use of our nation's nuclear energy power plants, the NRC, is currently working with just three commissioners and two vacancies. Instead of in ensuring transparency and accountability of the American people, the president has chosen to rely on his climate czars who are sitting in the White House and not accountable to us. Both of us are ready to advise and consent on nominees that the president brings. It is time for him to stop delaying and to nominate individuals for the positions I mentioned uh, and to stop shielding the administration's decisions. This morning, we just have two nominees, and they're great nominees, <laughs> but it should be more. I want to thank you again, Chairman Carper, for today's hearing, and I want to thank our two nominees again for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Senator Capito. I, uh, I think uh, I had uh, breakfast with... Uh, uh, Administrator uh, Regan, um, maybe a month or two ago. I think you'll find that um, constructive and, and helpful. And uh, Senator, uh, Senator Capito and I try to meet uh, most Thursdays, either in person or, or by phone if we're uh, on the road. And the, uh, some of the, the, some of the uh, vacancies that you mentioned that uh, we're looking for nominee, let's just talk about those. See what we can do to shake, uh, shake a few trees loose from the trees, okay? All right. Um, with that, uh, thank you for your, for your comments, uh, uh, Senator Capito. Now we look forward to hearing from uh, our, our nominees. We want to start with uh, Dr. Jennifer Clyburn Reed. Dr. Reed, you are recognized for your statement. Please proceed. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of this committee, good morning, and thank you for granting me this opportunity to appear before you as you consider consider President Joe Biden's nomination of me for federal co-chair of the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission. I also want to thank your staffs for the time spent with me over the last for the, over the past several days. The discussions have been engaging and informative. I am grateful to President Biden for the faith and confidence placed in me by this nomination. If afforded the opportunity to serve, I pledge to prove your confidence well spent and do my family and friends proud. Here with me today, my husband of 29 years, Mississippi native and Florida A&M graduate, Walter Reed. My father- Did you say Walter, Walter Reed? Walter Reed, yes. Like in the hospital? <laughs> yes. My father, Welcome. the Honorable Jim Clyburn, with whom you are probably somewhat aware. Joining me remotely, my son, Walter A.C. Reed, a graduate of Coastal Carolina University. My daughter, Sydney Reed, a Mississippi State graduate and third year medical student at the Medical University of South Carolina. My sisters, Mignon and Angela Clavern. My father and sister-in-law, Jackson State alumni, Dr. Walter Reed and Dr. Kathy Taylor. And to the kinship and friendship circles, supporting me from home. Thank you. I began my professional career 29 years ago as a public school educator with a master's degree. Over the next 25 years, I served as a classroom teacher, a middle school basketball coach, a State Department of Education specialist, 
Along the way, I earned two additional academic credentials, an education specialist and a doctorate from Nova Southeastern University in Florida. I concluded my educational career as director of a teaching equity center at the University of South Carolina, where I also co-founded the Apple Corps Initiative, a teaching, recruitment, and retention scholarship program. I have continued my commitment to education as a committee member of the Emily E. Clyburn Honors College Endowment at my state's only public supported HBCU, South Carolina State University. Throughout these professional roles, I have remained true to my father's counsel that one should find something to do for which you are not paid. My community service began as a Girl Scout, then tutor at a public housing tutorial center with my sorority sisters of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I served as board chair of the Greater Columbia Community Relations Council and currently serve as president of a nonprofit which promotes first time home ownership and the preservation and restoration of distressed and abandoned properties. I believe that this background would be beneficial to me to, as I seek to continue my public service in a broader capacity in a wider community through the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission. The commission, which was authorized in 2008, focuses on distressed economic conditions in portions of six states, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, and all of the state of Florida. Six states share two active regional commissions, the Delta Regional Authority and the Appalachian Regional Commission. If confirmed, my initial goal will be to assess the needs and assets of each community within the commission's 342 counties and identify challenges and determine the tools needed to progress them from distressed into transitional and attainment status. The commission would then work closely with economic development districts in partnership with state and local leaders to formulate regional action plans using current and trending statistics with the input of community voices. Believe me, I learned early in my career that one size does not fit all. The commission would seek to fund entities that make economic development a sustainable priority while stimulating local entrepreneur development and nurturing private investment. The formula used to target distressed counties through Congressman Clyburn's 10-20-30 plan states that 10% of certain appropriated funds be targeted to persistent poverty communities identified by the Census Bureau, where 20% or more of the population has lived at or below the poverty, le poverty level for 30 or more years. According to a report from the Congressional Research Service, defining persistent poverty counties, there are 407 in the United States. 92 or 22.6% of them fall within the jurisdiction of the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission. Working in tandem with state and local municipalities to create opportunities to fill gaps in education attainment, workforce preparedness, job creation, and physical and human infrastructure are challenges that beg for cooperation at all levels. And if confirmed, the commission will not waste valuable time recreating the wheel. Instead, it will consult with other federal co-chairs to emulate best practices. I will carry out the objectives of the commission to strengthen areas with the greatest needs and I look forward to working with this committee to ensure that the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission works for all of its citizens. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee, thank you again for this opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Redden. Sen Senator Capito, I just, uh, my first thought is the apple did not fall far from the tree. All right. Um, 
Dr. Frey, we, we were joking yesterday about how he pronounces his name. A lot of people, F-R-E-Y, they pronounce it Fry, but he pronounces it Frey. He's a big music fan. He loves a band called The Frey from Colorado, How to Save a Life. You're on, Ms. Uh, Dr. Frey. Welcome. Uh, th thank you, Senator Carpenter. Uh, sorry, Senator, <laughs> Senator Carper, and good morning, Ranking Member Capito and members of the committee. I'm honored that President Biden has nominated me uh, to serve as Assistant Administrator in the Office of Research and Development at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I also want to thank my wife, Deanna, and my daughter, Lauren, who are with me uh, today uh, for their support. Which one's your wife? <laughs> The, the really good-looking woman sitting behind me. <laughs> oh, would you raise your hand, ma'am? Uh, all right. Nice to see you. Welcome. Thanks thank for sharing them with all of us. Thank you, sir. Uh, and, and, and in fact, she, she is sharing me with, with all of you, I, and, and I'm honored that she is. I also want to thank my extended family uh, in New York, West Virginia, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida who are watching today. Uh, science and the environment have long been my passions and my purpose. I grew up in lower Manhattan in the 60s and 70s. My family lived in a rent-controlled walk-up building built in the 1880s. There was lead paint on the walls, choking smog outside, and greasy flakes of soot wafted from the sky, smearing my bedroom windowsill. This affected me so much that when I was eight years old, I wrote an essay titled Pollution. And I posited that pollution is bad for people and animals too. And although I didn't realize it at the time, I identified multiple environmental media, fate and transport pathways, and adverse effect outcomes. My father typed and copied my essay and gave it to all of our neighbors. This was my first publication. I trace my career and my passion and purpose uh, to that essay and to my firsthand experience with environmental pollution while growing up. My parents instilled in me a passion for the environment as well as a sense of duty to serve the public. My father served honorably in the United States Marine Corps. After his military service, he became an oceanographer and a professor he spent the last 22 years of his career with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and he now rests at Arlington National Cemetery. My mother's passion was art. She was a painter and a writer. Her last book was a novel about dolphins for which she conducted extensive research. Although not rich in a material sense, she had enormous wealth of spirit. She taught me to listen to many different voices, understand how things work, and work with others to find solutions. With my parents teaching me the value of listening, observing, and public service, it's no surprise that I found my way to environmental science and engineering. I've been privileged to have spent most of my career in academia, including 27 years at North Carolina State University, while there, I researched how to improve the efficiency and reduce the cost and emissions of coal-fired power plants. I helped governments and industry develop cost-effective solutions for emissions prevention. I researched improved quantitative methods for uh, uncertainty and exposure and risk assessment. And my research has focused on measurement and modeling of vehicle emissions and human exposure to air pollution. My research has helped inform a variety of decisions from improving traffic signal timing to reduce vehicle emissions, uh, as well as the selection of ambient air quality standards taking into account uncertainty in risk assessment. As an experienced researcher and professor, I am a champion of science and its essential role in keeping American families healthy and safe. I'm proud of the quality, scope, and impact my work has had as demonstrated by my extensive peer-reviewed publication record and numerous awards, including the Excellence in Air Pollution Control Award from the Air and Waste Management Association. I have been invited to share my expertise on numerous national and international expert advisory panels. As uh, Senator Carper noted, I've worked multiple times with the Office of Research and Development, and I've served on the Science Advisory Board and chaired the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. I believe that I have the scientific credentials, expertise, experience, vision, and commitment to serve as ORD's assistant administrator and to lead ORD's world-class research staff. 
senators uh, applying science to solve complex challenges that affect the lives of the American people has been my highest priority throughout my career. It would be a tremendous privilege to continue this dedication at EPA. And I recognize, uh, as Senator Capito alluded to, that science is just one of the many factors that inform policy decisions. If confirmed, my leadership will start with listening. The complex environmental challenges our nation faces require an all-hands-on-deck approach, drawing on the experience, expertise, and perspectives of numerous stakeholders, including all of you, uh, Senators. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Frey, thanks very much for uh, your testimony. Thank you both for your testimony and your presence today. We're now ready to begin with the questions for our two witnesses. Senator Capito and I have agreed to two five-minute rounds of questions with additional rounds at the discretion of the chair and uh, the ranking member. To uh, begin, this committee has three standing yes or no questions that it asks of all of our nominees who appear before us. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, each of you a question. For, there was a question for each of this. First, uh, do you uh, agree, if confirmed, to appear before this committee or designated members of this committee and other appropriate committees of the Congress and provide information subject to appropriate and necessary security protections with respect to your responsibilities? Do you, Dr. Reed? Yes, sir, I do. Dr. Frey? Yes, sir, I do. Second question. Uh, do you agree to ensure that uh, testimony briefings and documents in electronic and other forms of communications or information are provided to this committee and its staff and other appropriate committees in a timely manner? Dr. Reed, do you? Yes, I do. Dr. Frey? Yes, I do. And uh, one more. Uh, do you know of any matters which you may or may not have disclosed that might place you in conflict of interest if you are confirmed? Uh, Dr. Reed, do you? No, sir, I don't. And Dr. Frey? No, sir. Good. Dr. Frey, you, uh, Dr. Reed, rather, uh, you spent uh, uh, many years as an educator and one who's, uh, I'm sure, taught and inspired other, other educators. Uh, I love to go into schools. I know my colleagues, Senator Capito, Senator Inhoff, do as well. And uh, I, I really enjoy uh, school assemblies, and even with little kids. And I always remember uh, in an elementary school, it was like a kindergarten to grade uh, five, and they had an assembly and a, lot of, a couple hundred kids. The front row was third grade, and uh, I spoke for a little bit. And then um, so when we had a Q&A, and this little girl, third grade, raised her hand, and she said, yes, ma'am, what would your question be? And she said, what do you do? Hmm. I said, well, I'm a United States senator. Every state, we have 50 states. Every state has two senators. You have uh, rules for uh, uh, your school, don't you? She said, yes. I said, rules on your bus? She said, yes. I said, rules at home? She said, yes. I said, we have rules for our country. And along with another senator, Senator Chris Coons, and our congresswoman, Lisa Pont Rochester, I get to help make the rules for the country. A little boy sitting next to her raised his hand. I said, yes, sir, what would your question be? He said, what else do you do? <laughs> And I told him that I try to help people, try to help people. And one of the ways that we try to help people is to, uh, um, you know, make sure they have clean air to, to breathe and water to drink and, and, and on and on. The, uh, but uh, if those uh, third graders had been asking you what you would be responsible for doing if you're confirmed for this position, how would you explain it to them that they and their parents and others could uh, get a real, a real appreciation for a position that's basically gone unfilled for, I think, decades. decades. And we talked to Senator Capito, talked about this administration has not, not filled every uh, seat that, you know, that could be filled with by nominee. But this, this, is a, this is a job that has, has gone like decades. Nobody, Democrat or Republican, right. has ever nominated one for it. So right. we're, that's about to change. That has changed. So go ahead, please. What do you do? What would you do? Thank you very much for that question, Senator. Um, and I envision having several conversations with many of my former students and their children at this point um, to let them know that my vision has not changed from when I taught them in school, and that is to help them become better citizens, to help their neighborhoods become more conducive to living and learning and growing and prospering. So um, the commissions, um, they all have a purpose, and that is to create strong infrastructure, to uh, create job development environments that are safe um, and pro promote private investments 
and entrepreneurship um, to really get that infrastructure, particularly in looking at broadband in the last mile. Um, so the commission will work with local leaders at the grassroots level and help them at their level. And I have told um, people time and time again, the closer your government is to you, the more they influence your lives. So that is the level of influence in which we would help and the commission would help that level so that it, lives can be impacted immediately. All right. I, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to give us some preliminary an answer to the question I'm going to ask right now. Uh, <laughs> the question is this, uh, and, and you can answer further for the record. All right. Uh, are there ways that other agencies or even Congress, even this committee, uh, might be of, of help to you as you stand up this, this commission and, and lead it? How can we be helpful? So the... Uh, Thank you for the question. Um, other agencies that will be helpful, particularly your committee and Congress, um, first of all, will be the appropriation of funds to help the commission get off the ground. Um, as we noted earlier, this commission only exists on paper, so we would need to um, create um, s s small committees um, to stand up the committee um, in the Southeast region. Um, priority will be looking at where to have a presence. Where would that presence be um, as a physical structure and then um, move outward and broad, in a broad sense, to meet those um, people who are at the table and at the grassroots level. Um, I think that was... Um, All right, that's, that's a good start. Yeah. Let me, let me just note, uh, as it turns out, there are, there are, I think, seven of these regional commissions. This yeah. is one that's, uh, that we're trying to uh, stand up now. One of them is Appalachian Regional Commission, which is uh, right. a big part of West, uh, West Virginia. Right. And the chair is, is uh, somebody you know. It's Gail Manchin. And I, she, uh, Dr. Reed told me she was on the phone talking to uh, uh, Gail Manchin the other day. And I like to find, say, find out what works, do more of that. And one of the best ways you can do that is just reaching out like you did with the Gail Mansion yep. and the other regional commissions, find out what works and what doesn't. And I'm sure they'll be happy to help you. All right. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Senator Capito. Thank you, Senator Inhofe. Do you want to go in front of me? Well, that, I appreciate that very mm -hmm. much. Uh, Thank you uh, for the opportunity to move ahead of you and Get over to another committee that I have. <laughs> no, I'm not ahead of you. But. Well, let me first of all say, uh, uh, Ms. Reed, that I, uh, unfortunately, I only served with your father for a year and a half. Uh, but that was a very rewarding year and a half, and I consider him to have remained a good friend in that time. Um, Dr. Fry Free, Fry Free, one more time. Frey. Frey. <laughs> Thank well, you, sir. That's it. Just like a spell. Yeah, that's it. Frey. The uh, EPA's Robert S. Kerr uh, Research Center, I know you're familiar with yeah. that in Ada, Oklahoma. It's been there for a long period of time. It's, it's, it's leading the nation in, on a type of water research known as Enhanced Aquifer Recharge, or EAR for short. And uh, they've done a very good job over a long period of time. As you know, it uh, utilizes natural methods for the capture of, and replenishment of our nation's aquifers. And for years, Congress has allocated the funding, necessary funding, to keep that uh, going. Um, now, it was my understanding, and I got this secondhand, so I don't honestly don't know, uh, Dr. Frey, uh, the source of that, but they apparently... There's been a holdup in, uh, in, uh, in coordinating the local entities as we normally are expecting. Uh, would you make an advance, uh, uh, advancing research in this enhanced aquifer recharge a priority if you are uh, confirmed? Yeah, thank you, Senator Inhofe. For, uh, this is a, obviously an important issue for your state of Oklahoma uh, because the aquifer, the, the um, Arbuckle Simpson, our aquifer in particular, is a, a major resource for farmers, ranchers, and 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 anyone who drinks water. Um, and uh, yeah, the 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 program you allude to on enhanced aquifer recharge, uh, ORD staff 
have been working with the U.S. Uh, Geological, Geological Survey on engineered methods to use stormwater to help uh, recharge the aquifer. Um, and as you point out, that's being done at, at ORD's Ada Oklahoma Lab. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is an important priority for us. Um, it's something that I anticipate and, and uh, would, would expect under my leadership that we would continue to, to work with you on, on this issue because I know it's important to you and, and to Oklahoma. And it's also important that the same issues are faced in other parts of the country as well. Well, that, I appreciate that very much and that you uh, are familiar with that program. The, uh, I understand that you are on a leave of absence from, uh, it's an unpaid academic uh, post position that you've had with Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, one federal watchdog group called this, this Chinese university, quote, anything short of an arm of the Chinese government. Now, I'm, I'm pleased that you have committed to resigning this position uh, with this university should you be confirmed. I first want to ask you if that is, it would be your intention. Absolutely, sir, yes. And uh, do you share the concerns that we have that with China's poor record? They're, they're the largest polluter out there. And, uh, and on record, particularly as it, it remains the world's largest polluter, as they still are today. So what are your thoughts about that? And should that be a factor in your confirmation process? Well, thank you, Senator Info. I, I yeah, appreciate it. I want to give you a chance to address that because others have talked about it. Yeah, and, and I really appreciate this opportunity. I, 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 you know, my, my involvement with uh, research colleagues in Hong Kong is uh, because as an educator, uh, for 27 years, I've, uh, my goal has been to mentor students and to develop new knowledge. And uh, it's a very common practice in academia to seek out international collaborations, especially in areas of science where we can um, deal with challenging scientific issues that help us push the, push the boundaries of our own science. And so my, my relationship with colleagues at the, at the HKUST, the university you mentioned, has been one of research and mentorship of students and collaboration, specifically on issues of human exposure to air pollution. I think we all know that that region of the world is facing uh, very severe air pollution. And there's actually a lot of interesting science issues there that we can learn from uh, to inform uh, best science here in the United States. So my work has really been in the realm of the science, not in the, the realm of the policy or the geopolitical issues that you mentioned. But I, I will say that when I came on board in my current role um, with the EPA uh, nine months ago, I, I fully disclosed all of, all of my affiliations, including this unpaid adjunct affiliation. And I've been following the advice of our Office of General Counsel at EPA and ethics officials uh, and uh, on that advice, if confirmed, I, I would resign this unpaid adjunct position. Yeah, it's always been concern to me uh, that many of the extreme groups that are out there uh, hold a, a great regard for, for China and their record, and yet they continue to be the greatest polluter around. Um, I've often wondered how they get by with that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Doctor. You're welcome, Senator. And thank you, uh, Senator Capito, for giving me some time up front. Senator Capito, you're, uh, uh, you're next. And, uh, Senator Graham, welcome. And uh, once uh, Senator Capito has asked a few questions, you'll be recognized. You'll be next in line. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, Dr. Frey, I, I, when we talked on the phone last week, I kind of hit you, I think, <laughs> with a surprise. So I'm going to talk about the 2019 research paper, of which you were one of many of the authors, that laid out an ideal situation uh, on college football tailgating, which would be uh, a ban on idling, charcoal grills, and old generators. Well, we decided that this was not realistic, and you did tell me that you grill out at least three times a week, I do. and you are fuel agnostic. So thank you for clarifying <laughs> that world-changing uh, research paper because, uh, and I can imagine those South Carolina Gamecocks would not be for that either. Um, That's the only reason we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, nor, nor the Wolf Pack, to be honest. Nor the Wolf Pack, yeah. yeah. 
Um, let's talk a little bit. You wrote a, a, a letter to the editor in the Raleigh News and Observer uh, uh, taking on the Clean Power Plan claims. And in the letter, you disputed assertions that the Clean Power Plan was, quote, an act of overreach. Uh, you're going to be dealing with this, and I would imagine are going to be asked to do research in this area. As we know, the Clean Power Plan has fallen, and, and there is speculation, at least we're hearing, that there's going to be something that comes in to fill the space. I guess, um, do you believe that EPA acted within its statutory, statutory authority when it issued the Clean Power Plan, and should EPA use the Clean Power Act to regulate a, pa a power plant's carbon dioxide emissions outside the fence line? Yeah, thank you, Senator Capito. And, and obviously, uh, carbon emissions from power plants are a substantial uh, issue of, of national environmental interest. In, in my career, uh, early in my career, I, as a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University, I did research with the U.S. Department of Energy uh, laboratory in Morgantown, West Virginia, where I was doing um, techno-economic assessment of clean coal technologies. And uh, I've done a little bit of work looking, for example, at, at uh, carbon capture in, in some of my research as well. So I, I know this is an important issue. Um, with regard to the letter that you reference, uh, a colleague and I um, were mainly addressing uh, what we viewed as uh, just some factual issues in an op-ed that had been published uh, a week or so earlier. Uh, so we weren't so much getting to the legal authority for the Clean Power Plan, and, and I do know that's an issue of uh, robust debate uh, on, on, on the part of multi-stakeholders. And certainly, uh, you know, if confirmed as an assistant administrator for the Office of Research and Development, it's really not my swim lane or space to weigh in on those legal policy issues. Uh, my commitment would be to lead ORD to provide the, the science that's needed to inform those kinds of decisions on the part of our partner program offices that would be considering those legal and policy issues. So I would urge you, should you, you know, be in this position, that this is where the transparency aspect comes in. I mean, not to shield part of the research or part of the science that comes from uh, Maybe sometimes it doesn't say exactly what the policymakers want it to say. We know that happens frequently. Yeah. So I would, I would just make that plea again uh, for, for, uh, for the transparency. Um, Dr. Clyburn-Reed, uh, you, you mentioned uh, 342 counties in the, in the Crescent. Um, as I spoke about in my opening statement, I have quite a bit of um, experience with the ARC and, and the great work can do. You, you said a couple things in your, in your opening statement that are important. First of all, it was partnerships. A commission can't do it all. You have to work with your local, uh, all, all, all up and down the, um, the spectrum from private to public entities. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's good. The other thing I would say, um, you mentioned the persistent poverty counties of 92 counties. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to have to prioritize. Obviously, if right. you're starting anywhere, you've got to figure out where you can have the biggest bang for your buck, but also make the most as you said, make the most of uh, uh, impact with what you have. Um, is that how you would prioritize in terms of the lowest poverty? I mean, I would recommend that myself, I guess is what I'm saying. Start with the places that you can really make improvements on. And I liked your uh, talk about broadband and answer to one of the questions, because that's one way, I think, that you can see measurable improvements. So have you thought about these 92 persistently poverty counties? I'm sure many are in... Some are in South Carolina, not everywhere. Uh, and so how would you attack that kind of um, um, economic development issue? Thank you for that question. And yes, those 92 counties are really concerning. That's a lot. Right. Okay. So um, first, as I've had a conversation with Gail Manchin in the Appalachian, um, I will have a conversation with her chief of staff, chief of staff as well, mm -hmm. as to how they go about mm -hmm. um, prioritizing, mm -hmm. and we would mirror our actions after what the um, ARC actually does. Um, in looking at the needs of my state in particular, um, one size does not fit all, like I said before. So the grassroots level community leaders, um, this state, working with the, at the state level with the governor's office, um, we would come up with a plan that would be conducive 
to the state that we're in. And every state will be responsible for doing that, every governor. So we will look at seven different plans, and then we will prioritize those particular counties first and then move from there. Well, I would imagine with your background as an educator, you have a, a good a reach into that aspect of persistent poverty, what's the education availability levels and all those kinds of things that I think probably contribute to some of the factors of the high poverty levels. So I will turn Absolutely. to Senator, Senator Graham. Well, thank you. Thank you both very much, Senator Carpenter and Senator Capto. Uh, I'm here very quickly because I've got a hearing in judiciary to give my wholehearted support to Dr. Cl uh, Clyburn Reed for this job. Uh, I have known her and her family quite a while. This is an excellent choice. She will do a great job. I know um, the entire family is proud, but all of us in South Carolina are very proud of the fact that you can, that you'll be uh, the co-chairman of this organization. And I just want to thank you for being willing to serve. Thank you, Senator. And um, I just echo what Senator Capito said: broadband is a game changer. Mm -hmm. We've learned from COVID, if you can't go to school and you're stuck at home and the internet doesn't work, your kids fall behind. Uh, that telemedicine is the future. Getting to the doctor, you don't have to get on the road as often. Uh, you can consult your doctor if you have the uh, right technology. That keeps people off the highway and keeps us safe and allows medicine to be done in a new and different way. So as the electric co-ops changed rural America about 75, 80 years ago, I think broadband is going to be the equivalent of that uh, for the 21st century and beyond. And I want to recognize the work your father's done on this. And uh, Jim's here. So I know he's here as a uh, proud father and as a uh, distinguished member of Congress and a uh, uh, very well-known and respected South Carolinian. So I look forward to helping you with this nomination. And when you get the job, I want to do what Senator Capito did, said let's Let's put all of our resources into upgrading uh, these rural counties who have been left behind, and many of them predominantly African-American. And, Mr. Fry, I'm glad to see that you've changed your opinion about charcoaling at ball games. So <laughs> all's good. Thank you both. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us, Lindsay. Um, I uh, want to turn now to uh, maybe a question, a question for Dr. Fr uh, Dr. Frey. Uh, dealing with experience and goals uh, for the EPA Office of Research and uh, Development. Uh, Dr. Frey, before joining EPA earlier this year as the Office of Research and Development's uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Science and Policy, you already had significant experience working with the agency, uh, including 10 years in which you served as a member of the EPA's Scientific Advisory Board, uh, a member for VIFRA Scientific Advisory Board, and a member and chair of the EPA Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. How has this experience informed your approach to leading the Office of Research and Development, and what are your goals for this office if confirmed? Yeah, thank you, Senator Carper, for, for that question. And the, uh, those experiences that you referenced have been uh, very influential and formative in um, my preparation, if confirmed for this role, uh, through all of those federal advisory committees that I've served upon, uh, what I've learned from that is how incredibly important it is that the agency have access to the independent external scientific advice of world-class experts who are leading uh, scientists in their respective fields. And also, it, you know, the, the problems we face uh, transcend so many boundaries, including boundaries of scientific disciplines. And we really need, you know, all scientists on deck, just like we need all hands on deck uh, more broadly. And these committees are an important way that we engage with the external science committee in an open and transparent manner, uh, including public comment and the opportunity for our external experts to hear the views of multi multiple stakeholders and consider that in providing their advice and peer review to the agency. Uh, so it, it's a critical role. Uh, in terms of uh, my priorities, if confirmed, um, my, my three biggest priorities, uh, number one, 
Um, ORD um, has an outstanding uh, career workforce, and I'm so proud uh, to work with the career scientists and all the support folks in ORD. Um, we need to be positioned for emerging challenges and for challenges of the future. And so it's critical that uh, with the resources available to us from Congress, that we hire uh, scientists in key disciplines that will move us forward, and also that our workforce becomes more diversified and that uh, our workforce looks more like the America that we're serving. Um, number two, we have so many um, high priority, urgent scientific challenges um, that, you know, from the president, from the administrator, and what we're hearing from our state stakeholders, uh, tribal stakeholders, community stakeholders, and the scientific community. Uh, issues that I think you're all well aware of, um, climate and environmental justice, PFAS, lead, um, the, the aquifer recharge that Senator Inhofe referred to, harmful algal blooms, and many, many others. And uh, so ORD is, is a national resource, and I'm, I would be very proud to lead the science team at ORD to, to meet the science needs of the country and the agency. And um, then the last thing is um, we really need to help um, solve problems, but we have to do so, as Senator Capito alluded to, with, with credibility. Um, and it's, it's important to me that we do our science with integrity uh, and that we develop and uh, translate the best available science to inform all of our partners. Uh, we need to do policy-relevant science that answers policy questions, um, but we need to do rigorous best available science, and that's the role of ORD. Good. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Reed, uh, you've had a chance to actually take a shot at the question I'm going to ask you right now, but I want to, uh, if you want to amplify on what you said earlier, go ahead. Go ahead. But here's my question. Um, how does your experience uh, in South Carolina inform your understanding of what the Southeast Cre uh, Crescent Regional Commission can do for communities across uh, the Southeast Crescent region? Thank you for that question. Um, my experience in South Carolina in education, let's start there mm -hmm. first. Um, as an educator, it is my job to do long-range plans. So looking at our long-range plans as an educator, I make monthly goals, then weekly lesson plans, then daily lesson plans. So this is a process that I've done for over 30 years. So in approaching um, the activities of the Southeast Re Regional, Regional Commission, um, I would start with a strategic plan. And in that strategic plan, then we would outline um, the needs and the assets of each one of the communities in each one of the states. Um, particularly in South Carolina, we have seen how the lack of broadband in several areas has cost us economically. Um, and the primary goal of the commission is economic development. So we would need to fill the gaps in our state and in other states where those gaps are so that we can grow and prosper economically across the region. All right, great. Thanks, Thanks for that response. Senator Capito. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Frey, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I mentioned in my opening statement that there is no nominee for the Office of Air and Radiation. If, that, if there were a nominee, I would ask this nominee that qu this question as well. But apparently Joe Goffman, who is the current unconfirmed head of the Air Office, has said that the administration is working on an initiative regarding the power sector. So that leads us all to guess, what is that? It could be a suite of regulations uh, to drive down carbon uh, dioxide emissions by squeezing the power sector through regulations on issues other than carbon dioxide, like emissions, water, waste, and the net effect being to force coal and perhaps natural gas plants to not only reduce operations but possibly close. Are you aware of this initiative that's going on uh, under his leadership? And for which, uh, you know, have you provided research assistance on this? Yeah, thank you, Senator Capito. Uh, yeah, of course, it's the role of ORD to provide uh, scientific uh, support and advice and information to support the, the work of our program offices. And uh, ORD, for example, um, has a capability to do energy mix modeling and life cycle analysis, uh, and also to look at the, the health effects related to 
um, you know, the operations of the energy sector. So these would be the kinds of support that we, we can provide. Um, and certainly there are discussions within the agency on initiatives, but as far as, you know, specific details of what the Office of Air and Radiation is, is considering, um, I would have to defer to, to that office uh, since, you know, our focus is on the science and not the, the policy. But I'd be happy to take your question back with me to okay. the agency. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I guess my question, too, was to, to your knowledge at present, has this already been involved the Office of uh, R ORD to bring forward uh, specific studies that would help with this regulatory goal? Or you're not aware you want to get back to me on that? I, I think I, I would want to get back to okay. you on that to give you an accurate okay. answer. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, also, uh, the Office of Research and Development oversees the Integrated Risk Information Center known as IRIS. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Yes. Um, the IRIS program, um, and I guess you must have been alluding to this a little bit, uh, the health hazards of certain chemicals, hazard assessments are then used to help uh, health standards. You know this is an issue that I'm very concerned about as, as it relates to the, to the PFAS issue. Um, the GAO has criticized EPA for the length of time to complete a ha uh, IRIS hazard assessment. The agency has been further criticized for the lack of use usefulness of some of those assessments. Would, could you describe to me how you could modernize this system and this program to respond to some of the previous criticism? Yeah, thank you, Senator. Yeah, I, I, the IRIS program has been with the agency for well more than a decade, I think longer than that. And in my own career, um, in addition to the, the service I've had on EPA advisory committees, I've served on a number of National Academy of Science bodies, um, including the, the Board of Environmental Studies and Toxicology that's done a number of studies uh, that oversee and provide advice uh, and peer review of IRIS. Uh, so I, I know that over the years, IRIS has undergone um, uh, mature, maturation uh, as a result of the uh, expert peer review advice from the National Academies. Um, in recent years, the staff have modernized uh, approaches on things that we call systematic evidence mapping um, and um, um, uh, related techniques for assessing the overall body of evidence. And this has been based on recommendations from the National Academy of Science. Um, we also are very mindful that you know, in using resources for this program, we, we need to complement and not be duplicative of any other resource use in the agency. And so we do coordinate very closely with our partners in the program offices. Um, IRIS assessments uh, do serve the, the needs of science, uh, of really all of the regulatory programs, the, the air, water, land, and chemicals offices. Um, and uh, we work very closely with, with the programs as well as the EPA regions to understand uh, for what chemicals do they see a need for assessment so that when we do an assessment, it's on a chemical that for which they need information that serves a, a practical purpose. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to show... Uh, refocus a little bit on PFAS. That's something that Senator, uh, an issue that uh, Senator Capito and I have focused on a lot, especially given the challenges they faced in West Virginia with PFAS and, and many other states, including Delaware, around Dover Air Force Base in particular. Um, but as as, uh, as you know, uh, uh, last week, Administrator Regan, now this is for Dr. Frey, uh, Administrator uh, Regan uh, released a comprehensive strategic roadmap that lays out the agency's plans to address the complicated challenges of forever chemicals known as PFAS. Considering uh, the role of the Office of Research and Development, I expect that your office would have a significant role in this effort. Uh, the question is, under your leadership, how will the Office of Research and Development support the implementation of EPA's PFAS roadmap, which was uh, announced and laid out earlier this month? Yeah, thank you, Senator Carper, for that question. And uh, in the PFAS roadmap, uh, one of the, the very first uh, premise of that is research. Uh, and, and the president and the administrator are committed to a science-informed approach on PFAS. And uh, so ORD will uh, certainly have, and, and if it confirmed under, under my leadership, will we'll have a front and center role on developing uh, the science to support our partners throughout the agency, but 
but also outside the agency, as you allude to, um, many states are, are dealing with PFAS, uh, tribal communities, um, com uh, communities in general. Um, and so uh, there are three main things that, that will be my focus. Um, number one is um, we actually need to develop more methods to measure PFAS in the environment. Um, there are literally thousands of PFAS, and yet there's approved methods for really only, you know, a dozens or so. Um, and we need to be able to measure them in multiple environmental media. And, and this is uh, one of the research areas where ORD will contribute. And this is necessary. Uh, we have to measure it to be able to manage it. Um, the second is ORD is, uh, I think, leading, uh, you know, a, providing world-class leadership on how to do the, the toxicity testing so that we can understand the human health and environmental effects of PFAS, recognizing because there are so many PFAS, they're not all the same, and we have to account for variations among different PFAS to have effective management schemes. And then the third is we have to know how to manage PFAS. What can we do to remediate PFAS or to treat PFAS in drinking water or wastewater or to destroy PFAS? Uh, and these are technologies that ORD is, uh, is, is assessing and providing advice to our partners. Uh, we talk, you talked earlier about being, uh, wanting to be guided by, uh, by science, and that's, uh, I think that's great. We, we hear that. Uh, we want to as, as well. We also want to make sure that we make some progress. In the last administration, I, I think it's unfair to say we wasted four years, but uh, we didn't get much done. In the last administration, I'm pleased that this administration has laid out a roadmap, and Senator Capito and, and myself and others on this committee are anxious to make sure that we make real progress in in uh, the next uh, months, uh, as well as the uh, the the coming uh, the coming year. Um, how to save a life? There's a lot of ways we can save a life, but one of the ways we can save a life is just make sure we focus on PFAS and getting it right, uh, and uh, we're intent on intent on doing that. Um, the, uh, I have a one, maybe one last question, and we'll yield to Senator Capito for any last questions or comments that she wants to, uh, to, to make. But uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, tribal nations. We work on this committee a fair amount with tribal uh, nations, which uh, was a surprise to me when, when I joined the committee, but uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege. But if, if you're confirmed, how would or how will the Office of Research and Development work with tribal nations across our country to improve the natural uh, environment and health of indig indigenous uh, Americans. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Y you alluded to my current role uh, at ORD, and so I've been with the agency for about nine months, and one of my uh, priorities in coming on board has been to engage with, with tribal communities and tribal representatives. Uh, I'm really proud that the Office of Research and Development has a tribal science council, and we have a collaborative model of uh, working in partnership with uh, tribal representatives from across the country on identifying science issues and working together with tribal scientists to address uh, those issues. And, and you know, certainly we're hearing from our tribal partners about um, climate change, environmental justice issues, water resources. Um, but we also have to recognize the importance of um, traditional ecological knowledge and tribal life ways as factors that are important to tribes in identifying problems tribes think are important. And we have to be careful not to assume that, you know, in our offices in Washington, we know the answers that the tribes need. It's very important that we uh, engage with tribes. Um, and I mentioned in my opening remarks that my leadership will start with listening. <clears throat> and I have been listening, <clears throat> excuse me, to the tribes. And uh, as part of our research planning efforts, which are actually ongoing at this time, we will be doing formal consultation with tribes uh, to um, internalize their concerns into our research agenda. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Senator Capito, any last uh, thoughts or questions that you'd like to add? Uh, no, I'd just like to thank both of you for being here and your families and, and, the, and your support. Uh, and I, again, I just want to um, express my gratitude for your willingness to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I would say uh, uh, I uh, want to second that emotion. But uh, we want to thank you both um, uh, for being here today, Dr. Reed. Uh, real pleasure, pleasure to see you in person. And uh, 
Dr. Uh, Dr. Frey, thank you for being here today and teaching us how to pronounce your name. <laughs> thank you, sir. The, uh, we're grateful for both of you for your willingness to serve our country, especially at a time uh, addressing our nation's environmental challenges. There's plenty of them, but also fostering economic development is so critical. Uh, I, I, Dr. Reed, I spent uh, some, some time as governor, actually before that, focusing on uh, job creation, job preservation. And the Appalachian Regional Commission, a lot of state, a lot of that commission is, is included in the state that uh, Senator Capito uh, represents and, and say I was born in. And uh, we, I mentioned to you um, the other, uh, when we spoke earlier this week, uh, governors don't create jobs. Senators don't create jobs. Presidents don't create jobs. Uh, even chairs of uh, commissions, regional commissions, don't create jobs. But we help create a nurturing environment for job creation. And I mentioned the uh, Center for, for uh, Excellence, Automotive Excellence in Southern Delaware, where it's, it's uh, housed at the Delaware Technical Community College campus. But it's a partnership that involves auto dealers, poultry industry folks, the Economic Development Administration, County, Sussex County, State of Delaware, all of the above. And it's sort of like we take, we take our ropes and pieces of ropes and tie them together to create a, a community rope. That's that the best economic development I've ever seen is where we, we do it in, in that in that as a partnership. And the, you're going to have an opportunity to help provide some of the rope and help tie those ropes together. So uh, make uh, make uh, make the most of, of that. Uh, again, again, I want to say to your your, uh, your families who are here, particularly to your dad. Uh, uh, Miss, Miss Dr. Reed, uh, great to see him, and I want to thank him and, and your mom for raising you and uh, preparing you for all these opportunities you've had. And I would say it again to uh, to Dr. Uh, to, to Chris Frey, Dr. Frey. Uh, I, uh, I know your wife is here, and uh, we. I want to say thank you for your willingness again to share your husband. Is that your daughter over your right shoulder? And uh, and what is her name? Lauren. Lauren, Lauren, very nice to see you. Thank you for for, uh, for joining us. You've done a good, really good job raising your dad. <laughs> <laughs> and you can you can be proud of the way he's turned out. Um, let's see here. Uh, I would, uh, if I could be serious for uh, for a moment. Uh, I uh, we understand uh, it's not hard. It's not uh, hard to uh, understand why. The president has nominated each of you for these important positions, and our hope is that you can get confirmed without delay so that you can go to work, assemble your team. One of the most important things to do is assembling the team. You have a great opportunity, Dr. Reed, to put together a team, to put together, assemble a team, right? Like it's like you have a blank board and make the most of it. Just put the, find the best people you can and surround yourself with them. Um, but uh, I think with, the, with that, uh, before you adjourn, maybe a little bit of housekeeping. And uh, I want to ask uh, unanimous consent to submit for the record a variety of materials that include letters from stakeholders and other materials that relate to today's nomination. Hearing is there objection? Hearing no none. Objection. Hearing none. Uh, senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of business on Wednesday, November 3rd, and we'll compile those questions. Send them to our witnesses and ask our witnesses to reply by Wednesday, November 10th. And with that, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you all.